Hello everyone, this is the last segment of chapter 2 in historical geology, rocks, fossils and time. Uh, this is Dr. Anna. Uh, in the last uh, slideshow I finished with the lithostratigraphic unit and this slide just shows you an example uh, of it. This, this is showing the Zion National Park Utah um, formation names and um, you can see them uh, right here and you see that the Chinla formation uh, on the slide is divided into the into some members I mean that's all because I told you that sometimes the formations are divided into members and beds and um, so this slide just shows you that and this is about the biostratigraphic units which is a body of strata which only recognize based on the fossil content and um, the boundaries doesn't necessarily match with the rocks uh, with the lithostratigraphic unit because it's only uh, matches the fossils the fundamental uh, biostratigraphic unit is the biozone biozone and the time stratigraphic units they're also called chronostratigraphic units and they consist of rocks and they deposited in, in a particular interval of the geologic time. And the basic time stratigraphic unit is the, is the system. And I think this slide is just a repeat. I already have kind of talked about it, but I'm not going to go back and restart it in no way. So this is just about the the geologic types we already talked about the ages, the eon and those guys. So this takes us to the correlation and the correlation is the process of matching up rocks from different areas. So basically you can start in the eastern United States and go all the way to the Grand Canyon and um, you want to do the correlation with some helps of different tools. One of the tools are the rocks and the other tools are the fossils, of course. So we do lithostratigraphic, lithos, lithostratigraphic correlation, which is simply just matching up the, and the rocks. And then you can also do time stratigraphic correlation, which also um, correlates based on time equivalence of events. Like here is a very simple lithostratigraphic, I always have a hard time saying this word, so I'm sorry for this. I guess you're better than me. You are better because you can speak English very well, not like me. So it's called lithostratigraphic correlation. So like in this case, you see there is a river channel right here. So it's pretty easy based on the rocks how to correlate from here to there, isn't it? So that's strictly based on the rocks. And this is two. Like you can see that because of the rock change right here, you know, when, when we need correlation, when do we really need correlation? We need correlation when you have um, no outcrops in an area. It's like a flat land, but you do have like some outcrop along roads or something or you have a borehole here and there and then you have the section in that borehole and then there is one in the other side of the state or whatever and then you want to know what's in between those so then you start correlating with the rocks right here you see simple and we'll do that in the lab so you're going to see now if we have this situation where this rock layer doesn't occur in this one that we know that it's a facious change and so it would just pinch it out just like this it's simple and then you've got this one and this one and that one and that's the top so the little stratigraphic correlation is pretty pretty easy and I mean because of it's easy that's why we're gonna do these in the lab now when we want to do really time equivalent then um, the, just relying on the rock composition is not necessarily enough so therefore 
most of the time the values, I mean not we, but scientists do use fossils to be able to do the time equivalence. Uh, but also that I, we're going to mention in a minute, <coughs> there are like um, lava beds and other other events that you can actually correlate with because you can do I am so sorry, I don't mean to be like that, but to tell you the truth, it's like 10 o'clock p.m. and I do this, so I'm tired, but I have to finish this because you will tell me that you need this because it's the second chapter and we are week two, so I have to finish this, however tired I am, I'm sorry. So we have to use the fossils, and um, that takes us to the biozones. For all the organisms which are extinct now, their existence marks two points in time, the time of the origin when they start, and then their time of extinction. Now, the most widely we can use the so-called index fossils, and index fossils are important. You have to know index fossils. These are fossils which are very easy to identify, so they are easy to recognize, and they are very widespread, which means widespread what type of fossils can be white, what type of living things can be widespread in? Just think about the trees being widespread in. Somewhat, but not really. You know, the most widespread in, because most of the rocks are in the ocean. So most of the index fossils are coming out of the ocean. And these guys have to be, they cannot be corals, because corals really leave attached uh, attached light, so they, they won't distribute easily. We, we need to use fossils which are good swimmers so therefore they distribute in the ocean all over and uh, also it is very important that they lived very short geologic time when we think of geologic time and lo very short that means one or two million years and then they change so we need fossils which are easily identified uh, geographically widespread it, and we need ones which are evolving, changing very, very often, like they stay the same about one to two million years, five the most. So here we are. Like out of these two, what do you think? Which one? Out of three, I see it's three. Like there is this trilobite, there is this Brachiopod, and then there is this other brachiopod. What do you think? Which one is count as index fossil? Seriously. Now, these black lines shows how long have they lived. Their they so-called lifespan. And see these guys, this one and this trilobite has very short lifespan. It's getting really bad, but I am going to finish this chapter. So the, the very short lifespan whereas this lingula has an extremely long time span. So obviously this would not be a good index fossils because it have lived for too long without any change, whereas the trilobite and this brachiopod have lived very short and then they change into something else. So these are the, the ones which are good for index fossils because they represent just a small little part of the geologic time. And on the long, long term, if you're interested in index fossils, I mean, some of you might want to be a geologist or, or fossil collector or whatever. This shows you the geologic time, and these are the most commonly used index fossils throughout the Earth history. And we really use these uh, type of correlation a whole lot. Uh, this is the so-called con concurrent range zone. That just means that you have a bunch of fossils in certain rocks and they put their lifespan and whichever occurred in both section from the same lifespan, that is going to be the age of that rock. So it's quite well uh, usable uh, concurrent range zone. And then we also very many times use the short duration physical events. We call them key beds. The key beds can be lava, ash falls, and then they also can be lava flows. So when you have those, then you can actually obtain absolute age from those lava flows or, or lava beds or ash falls. 
so they're really really helpful so all together these are the environmental clues we can get out of the of the sedimentary rocks they the grain size which tells us about the, the transportation medium, how far it went, the grading, which could be depend on the energy environment. Could it be a, a flood or something? Now, the, the sorting and the rounding is going to give us information if it has been reworked or how far it got transported. The cross bedding will always give, give us um, info about, you know, if it was carried by the wind or was it a wave or current action and the fossils also give us environmental clues because if it's corals or echinoderms then we know it was salt water if it was insects or amphibians we know it's fresh water if you have leaves or land animals you know it's terrestrial continent and then the color and the chemistry will give us info about the oxygen level um, or the climate. So these are very, this chapter was important in terms of understanding how to define the rock forming environment. Basically these chapters are giving you the ladders of the puzzle of earth history so knowing that you can read the rocks and be able to put together the earth history. <clears throat> and I guess it's time for me to go to sleep and I just finished chapter two so you can study. Bye.